Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Nikolai. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at Oceanside Museum of Art. Uh, and we are thrilled to welcome you back to another virtual artist talk. This small talk is the last installment in a three-part series focusing on the multi-year partnership between OMA and the Mission Pacific Hotel and the Seabird Resort, and will feature three of the exhibiting artists in conversation. Um, so we're really excited about what, what's happening here tonight. If you're new to Zoom, um, there are a couple of things. And hi, Rebecca, I see you there. Welcome. Um, if you're new to Zoom, there are a couple of interactive features that we'd like to point out just before we get started. Uh, first, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat box. Um, if you know anything comes to mind at any time during the broadcast, we'd love to hear what you're thinking, what resonates you. Uh, please share that with all of us, um, the panelists, as well as everyone at home by clicking on the chat box below. Also, at the end of tonight's program, uh, there will be time for a question and answer session. Um, we will we'll set aside 15 minutes for that. So um, if a question comes to mind, um, just something pops in your head or you'd like to ask all the panelists or one of the artists on, on tonight's panel, uh, please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to all of the questions at the end of the program. Um, our host for tonight is Rebecca Webb. And hi, Rebecca, great to see you. Uh, we're Likewise. excited to bring her back for part three uh, in the series. Um, Rebecca is the special project director and co-curator for OMA's Hotel Project, and is also a practicing visual artist whose work has been exhibited in numerous locations, such as San Diego International Airport, the Griffin Museum of Photography, and the San Diego Art Institute, among other public and private institutions. Uh, she was one of the driving forces that made this project become a reality for all of us here in Oceanside. We're so appreciative of that, Rebecca, and we couldn't be happier to have you here with us tonight. Are you ready to take it away? I am. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> I'd really like to thank audience members for joining us this evening and to our wonderful group of artists as well. Before I begin, I wanted to share a little bit about the project. About three years ago, the Oceanside Beach developers uh, re reached out to OMA to curate all the artwork for both the Seabird Resort and the Mission Pacific Hotel. By creating a unique uh, public-private partnership, they were gonna, going to be able to connect. We're connecting to the community of Oceanside. Uh, but they were also very interested in OMA creating programming, arts programming for the hotels to create a bridge between the um, between the museum and the hotels um, through you know creating exciting programs such as art talks and special packages, uh, artist workshops, uh, major events, um, and really exciting uh, planning that's that's will be coming out relatively soon. Uh, so uh, with Maria Mingle alone, the executive director and myself, um, and also the Oceanside Beach Resort team, we curated almost 3000 artworks by 110 Southern California artists from Los Angeles to the Valle de Guadalupe. We commissioned our uh, major uh, installations from emerging and established artists. We purchased paintings and sculptures. We licensed prints. And we are very proud to say that we were able to reach gender parity um, in terms of the artwork that we selected and in, in still in the museum world, often um, male men are um, much more represented than women, but we reached gender parity. And we also have a very strong showing of diverse voices. And I'm really excited to share the three artists with us tonight. Um, they are all working in uh, areas of, um, in the terms of the hotel, um, they're working in uh, areas of symbolism to convey message and meaning, either personal or what you know will be interesting to explore what they want the audience to take away. Um, from the from their work in the hotels, and we can also talk a little bit about their um, their past work as well, and how their the threads might uh, connect to what they're presently doing here in the hotels. Um, in terms of our structure this evening, I'm going to say hello to the artists, and then they're going to do uh, their self intros. They're going to talk a little bit about their work in the hotel, and and perhaps a little bit about their um, body of work uh, bodies of work. And then we will open it up to the audience for questions. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to, um, I, I skipped the part where I'm gonna be asking the questions and then the audience can ask the questions. So welcome to our beautiful artists and to our audience again, thank you. Um, I, I'm happy to say we have um, Annalise Neal here tonight um, and we have Margaret Noble and Einar De La Torre. So welcome everyone. 
So uh, let's start with Annalise Neal. And if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, and I think I believe there are some slides that will accompany your um, what you're going to be sharing with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be a part of the project and to be here tonight. I received my BFA in printmaking from the College of St. Rose in upstate New York in 2006. And my focus for that was in polio, um, which is etching. I've been in San Diego for 11 years this month, actually. Um, the longest I've ever lived anywhere. So I think I can call it home. <laughs> Um, in January of 2020, I learned the cyanotype technique and instantly fell in love. Um, the alchemy, the surprise, just kind of the layering of imagery uh, completely sustained me through the pandemic. Um, so I'm very grateful that I was able to get into that right before everything shut down. Uh, with my cyanotype work, I create imagined environments or worlds that I build using hand cut negatives of my photographs, as well as nature tokens or little things that I collect in the wilderness, like feathers or sticks or leaves. Um, so I create the image, which is a, it's a sun print, it's a photographic technique. And then I use the sun to make my exposures and I fix the imagery or you know, adhere it to the paper uh, using water from our ocean. Uh, after I do that, I use watercolor on top of the imagery to, you know, kind of push or pull highlights and lowlights, so formal qualities, but also to kind of bring in some surreal elements as well. And in general, I'm trying to convey the feeling of awe, euphoria, and heightened sensory awareness, and also talk about memory and time with this work. Um, before I did cyanotype, I was actually doing watercolor. I started doing that in about 2014. Um, I have two sons who are now nine and 11. So I was really busy for a long time being a mom and just kind of fell into watercolor because it's easy to kind of put down and come back to unlike a lot of the printmaking techniques or painting uh, with oil. So with my watercolor, I use a lot of visual metaphors um, to talk about how to be human. I'm interested in trying to understand time and perspective, empathy, deep listening. And in terms of my imagery for that work, I use a lot of time related imagery like rocks, horns, bones, hot springs. Uh, I'm really interested in trying to convey the idea of perspective. So I utilize things like diagrams of multiple dimensions or a Klein model, which is uh, I don't know, a metaphor, but also a physics concept related to infinity. Um, cones of time, which have to do with what does it mean, what does now mean versus past and future. I'll use gravitational warping. So I, I kind of run the gamut between philosophy, physics, nature, you know, all of it in both realms, both the cyanotype and the watercolor. And in terms of influences, uh, I really looked to Carlo Rovelli. He's an Italian theoretical physicist, very influenced by a lot of his ideas. Um, Yuval Noah Harari is a historian and author. David Lynch is a filmmaker artist. I love um, Haruki Murakami, the author. And then for visual artists, I love Inka Ezenhai, Matthew Barney, Louise Bourgeois, and Neil Rausch. So that's a little nutshell intro to me. Thank you, Annalise. Very interesting, the David Lynch reference. <laughs> I can see that in some of your paintings. <laughs> um, and Margaret Noble, you're next. If you could in, uh, talk a little bit about your work. Sure. Um, thank you. Well, hello, and, and thank you for having me. I realized that that my work is actually difficult for me to talk about um, and sometimes difficult for folks to wrap their head around. And I think that's because my concepts and my media is invisible often. I'm working in technology, I'm looking at sound, I'm using code, um, and then I'm juxtaposing that or layering it with physical materials. And so I wanted to show you a lineage of my work. So with these first four images uh, for the Seabird Resort, 
I made them exactly for the SIBO Resort. They did not exist before. And so they're looking at time and the past, obviously. They're a snapshot of history. They're spokes frozen in time. And you can advance to the next uh, couple of versions. Great. Um, and really my goal was thinking about all the things that we don't know and all the time and experience and the web of information between them and us right now. And so what I did was use computer programming to create a graphic design that sort of reflected a time-based portal um, so we could wonder more about what we don't know. We, I mean, I, for this picture, I don't even know who they are. I got this photo on eBay. You can forward to the next one. Um, yeah, and then so moving forward to the next slide, I just wanted to show you another way that I think in interdisciplinary media, and this is called uh, Dorian's Gray, and it uses light and sound. Um, it's a big installation, and it's another examination of technology, but uh, through the idea of narcissism, and it riffs off Oscar Wilde's book, <laughs> Dorian's Gray. Next slide, please. This is a more intimate sculpture of, of my work. When you put your head inside, the whole sound and lights come on. Uh, to me, it's all about anxiety, but it's also about technology or maybe anxiety of technology. Um, and reviews are mixed, whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant experience when your head's in the hole. Next slide. This one is called, Please Wait, I'm Not Done With My Diatribe. And it's sort of a cheeky, futuristic time machine, but it's also a slot machine. Um, it shows the viewpoint of a child's eyes looking at us now and the follies and mistakes we are making in harming our environment and in particular our beaches. Next slide. Uh, so this is another experiment with 2D work um, and historical photos. Um, and using photos to construct identity. I think we're all pretty familiar with using digital media to, or social media to tell the story you want to with whatever photos we choose to use. But I don't think that's new. I think, you know, we've been editing photo albums since the Victorians. And I love the idea of framing images uh, and seeing what might've been left out and what's the story between that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this one is sort of a more, like philosophical piece, I believe it's, it's called Thoughts on Trial and it's time-based. You wear headphones, there's randomized sounds and there's three randomized spotlights which shine on three holograms of seemingly random objects. Um, and it's really about seeing what happens in your mind um, and what associations you make and, and, and maybe comparing that with others and seeing how wildly different it can be. Next slide, please. And then this is my final slide. This is called Cerebral Departures. And it's really, it's about that space between waking and sleeping or digital and physical or natural and industrial, but it's like the space in between. And it's made from video and sound um, and wooden frames. And so that's my presentation. Thank you, Margaret. Wonderful. And Einar, you're next. Oh, I think he's, um, he's on mute. Let's see. You can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay. Loud and clear. So I was saying that uh, it's great to be here with such wonderful artists, and uh, we're glad to be here. Normally, my brother would be here, but he's on an airplane crossing the Atlantic right now. Um, so I work with my brother. We're a collaborative uh, team, uh, originally from Guadalajara, Mexico, but we, um, our career really has been in Southern California and Baja California together. Our studios are both in San Diego and where I am now is in the Valle de Guadalupe. Um, and so when we approached this uh, project, um, we started with the theme of the Tower of Babel, uh, working with uh, Bruegel, um, we worked with Bruegel before, he's a nice guy. Um, and so we thought about how towers are, the Tower of Babel has so much in symbolism, both positive and negative, but that really is the um, cacophony that we live in today. There's so many uh, languages and people in the world, and I think that's what makes, makes humanity rich and wonderful. 
So um, here we are with the, another piece. These pieces are in the elevator in um, Mission Pacific. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, uh, lenticular. It's not our main, um, it's one of our main, I guess, uh, focuses. Um, it, what it is, is that they used to call them winkies. It's old technology. Um, it is basically an image that has a lens in front of it uh, that lets you see one image or the other one, because uh, there's two images or maybe even more. Um, and I can get into the details. Um, but here you can see how they don't photograph well uh, because you need to have stereo vision to see them and cameras do not have that. So they're a lot sharper in person. The um, frame on this one is a water jet cut frame. Um, and this one as well, it's a water jet cut aluminum. Uh, in this case, we're also including not only the lenticular in the middle in the light box, but uh, some cast um, resin pieces going all around the, the artwork. Next image. Um, that's the one that's behind me now. Um, that is a takeoff on the Aztec calendar that we're making it about consumerism. We do a bit of work about uh, one of our major threads and in, in, uh, in ideas is uh, about how consuming, we're consuming our, our planet and ourselves in, in, in tow. And uh, the little face in the middle of this is very much under the Aztec uh, calendar, which has a heart on its tongue, uh, kind of consuming humans, but it's a potato chip brand from Mexico that's now in the United States, ubiquitous. And they like to say that uh, their, their, their little jingle is, uh, I bet you can't eat only one. Isn't that the problem that we have? Of course, there's, you know, heart-shaped pizzas and crucifixions and um, the usual stuff we, symbols that we work with. Next. Next slide. Um, so this is, for instance, the way that, um, that we work with lenticular is that we usually have two images. This is one image that gets cut into little fine lines, and this is the other one. And they get interlaced, and with a lens in front of it, you will see either one image or another, meaning that you have a parallax blocker. You will see this one or the last image, and that is how lenticular works. Also, the lens works to see depth, but that's a whole other um, uh, trick, if you will. All the hidden layers aren't thrown out in Photoshop so that you can actually sort of uncover an, uh, a layer and see behind it. And therefore, the, um, the illusion that you're actually seeing depth is, is quite, quite strong, even though it's still a flat, flat print with a lens on top. Next. And of course, we, we are known probably more so for our glass work. This is a piece with a blown glass head we made. I mean, my brother, um, a blown glass for many, many years. The, the baby's body is a, a found object from a, probably a pharmacy uh, selling diapers or something. We cut his head off and put our own glass head. The bed was also a found object and uh, it's sitting on a bed of roses that we cast in, um, in resin. Next. And this is, this is called the recurring dream. Um, it's sort of a pull toy that a chain goes in, invested into the, into the base, um, a kind of like how dreams have mobility, but they also have a sort of stiffness and they have that lack of mobility. We, we, uh, we pull our sources uh, for our work from many, many places. Next. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Einar. So what I did want to mention to everyone, to our audience members, is that all the works that we're discussing tonight are accessible in public spaces. Um, Margaret, one of Margaret's is, uh, she has um, several in the corridors of the Seabird Resort. And that um, is, you know, that's, you have access to that if you're actually staying in a room on that floor, but you, but but Margaret has a very prominent piece in the lobby, so um, so you know you can see, you can actually see the see the works important uh, in in person, and I think that's an important aspect um, of both hotels is that there is a lot of artwork available to um, to the public to come in and, and see the work. I mean, with Einar's work, it's wonderful. His work is situated. Uh, the De La Torre's brother work is situ situated in the elevators, so in Mission Pacific. So when you enter in each elevator bank, you will be confronted by this amazing piece. And what's really exciting, if you're in the, the elevator by yourself, it's almost like your own personal theater space. Um, they, you know, they, uh, they're illuminated from behind and they 
glow in the elevator. It's a really wonderful experience. And then um, when you go to the spa in the spa, you can enter the spa with um, Annalisa's work. You know, she has a beautiful installation. Um, you, you saw it in piecemeal when she was representing it um, through the slides, but it's a beautiful optical illusion, large installation piece. So it's something to behold as well. And then, as I said, Margaret's is, a, is in the lobby is a singular piece and it's um, you know already many fans, Margaret, of your, of your work. So um, what I'd like to start with, so the, the topic is this idea of author and audience. Uh, and, you know, so as the artist, you have your, you know, you, the process of materials you were discussing and what you're trying to convey. Is there a dissonance between what you think your audience will experience as, as opposed to what you're trying to convey? And, uh, you know, and, and again, we're talking about, we're not talking about in a hotel, which is a paradigm shift in a way to, uh, to, um, display and exhibit artwork versus a museum, right? So you might have a, have a different kind of audience focused on a museum versus, you know, people all over the world coming to the hotel. So you, you know, you might have different reactions. And so who would like to take that first, that question? I can jump in because I think you're, you're speaking to an opportunity. And I, I do feel yes. like in the beginning yeah. when I made my work, I'd get so frustrated. I'm like, why don't they understand what it's all about? And and, and with interactive works in particular, I, I quickly abandoned that and realized that wasn't what was interesting. Um, and, and that it's a really great challenge to see if you can create a read that other folks see the same as you do with it. So I gave that up. <laughs> oh, so that it's not, it's, it's not something, it's not something that you really feel is, is mandatory anymore. Like you, it's okay if you have a message and then someone else might experience it in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I can't prescribe art or how people interpret it. I will have hopes um, and I will intentionally work to create something, but I know I know that that may not always be read the same way by others. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, Annalise, what do you think? Hi, you know, I will say um, when I've been around the, the seabird piece with somebody, the number one thing I hear is people say, I don't understand this at all. Oh, really? I love that because to me, if you see something and you understand it, you're not going to engage. You're, you're going to walk away. So I think that having, like for me, when I make work, I want somebody to be confused, like to not understand what the topic is or how it was made or something. I mean, when I see art, I love that. It's a game and I'm instantly going to play you know, versus leaving the conversation. So yeah, I, I definitely think, um, I, you know, and, and I think it does depend on the work, you know, sometimes the work, it's really important to let people know what it's about, but at least with the Seabird one, I think that there's, there, it's a real open dialogue that, that anybody can really have and, you know, decide what they're going to take away from it though of course I have my reasons but I feel like it, it does have a good degree of um, space around it. Yeah I think with with all three um, artists this evening your work does invite um, you know a more a slower approach to uh, to in appreciating the work right like to relate to, you know to be curious and to spend a little time with the work to because you know especially I would say, especially in Einar and yours, in terms of like all the little intricate details, right? There's a lot to look at. Um, and Einar, what, what, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, um, I think that um, we prefer um, artwork that uh, allows you to think. I think artwork that is so pre, pre um, uh, specifically pre-made is um, can be a little preachy because you either get it or you don't and therefore you get into this realm of um, you know am I smart enough to understand this artwork right. and I don't a good position to put a viewer in um, I'm, I mean I tend to, to, to rely on them I like to think that when artists shows artwork in order to understand what they made so that's what's funny about asking an artist about what they made when, when we're like, we don't really, it's not about us. No, I do think it's an artist's uh, job to think about as many readings as possible. 
But the beautiful thing is that you can't think about all the readings. And that's when the viewer can teach you about what you made. And when you listen in on them, oh, it's beautiful, then it's yours. All the versions of a reading of your artwork become yours, but your potential fodder for future work because it's about learning. Has, has that anyone ever approached you at an opening and, and come up with something that you hadn't realized about your work that you that you actually felt you aligned with or you felt an affinity with in what they said? Well, more than approaching, I think it was more of an eavesdropping. It's spying on them, just sort of listening, listening to them. Because if they approach you, they 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 have this like, oh no, the artist knows what they're doing, I see, which right. is kind of a, a a wonderful lie. We 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 don't. That's why what's what's good about the creative process, I think, is not knowing fully what you're doing. Otherwise, you just become a machine of your own work, and you yeah. know. Uh, all of the analogies about how you become, you know, redundant uh, if you just keep doing the same thing. Right, right. I, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's exploratory process and, and you know, to allow that room for creative freedom and growth is um, really important to the artist process, I think. Absolutely. You know, um, today, actually, this morning, I heard a report on NPR with, um, uh, it was about Richard Donner, who is a filmmaker, and he uh, he uh, created the films Lethal Weapon and Goonies and, you know, those kind of movies. Um, but he was saying he always put, he liked to always have fun and, and you know, put little sort of symbols and um, icons around. That would be a personal joke. And, you know, some people would pick up on it. Others might like, you know, and he, um, in Lethal Weapon, he put a, uh, a sticker on the side of a fridge that's it was about us uh, free South Africa right and so uh, so the, so he, that you know that was his little his little you know reaching out to, to a certain audience for for those who noticed it I'm wondering do any three of you you know because you have a lot of symbolism um, you know icons uh, you know one could interpret them in many different ways but are there any you know and then painters did that right from the, the Flemish painters Renaissance painters they add a little subversive um, you know elements to their paintings to to it was like sort of you know their own private world but then also a nod to the initiated so do any of the three of you have do that at all in your work yeah i, I or you're not you maybe don't want to say <laughs> uh, i don't know am i coming to yes. oh okay. sorry yeah. sorry <laughs> um yeah i love that you brought up flemish art that's one of my absolute favorites and I love how you know you'll look at like a Dutch still life and it's just beautiful flowers and you look a little more carefully and there's like a dead lizard or a cracked egg or something you know and it's suddenly there's a gravity to the whole thing the whole experience of looking at it um, so I, I definitely like to include yeah some of those subversive elements um, and I think I, I, I'm really interested in how attention and consciousness are linked, you know, so I think those details, when you really key into them, that's what kind of elevates the all of life, but, you know, certainly the experience of looking or interacting with any art form, whether it's poetry or visual art or anything, but, you know, weaving in some of those little jokes, you know, sometimes I'll even just do a visual compositional play you know, certain colors interacting just to move your eyes over here or over there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do like almost using a super beautiful surface as the lure so that you're there, you've arrived, and now we can talk, you know, it kind of like brings you into the deeper, you know, components of the mm -hmm. Is there anything we should look for in your work um, that you might want to share that you're referring to? See, there's, um, I could have Adam bring up the slide for entangled laminae, but I don't think he I hope he's, hope he's listening. <laughs> okay, um, that's right. But yeah, just um, trying to think. Oh, okay. he's, he's gonna do it in one moment, he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be fun. I would love for you to point something out in your work. Pinkish painting of that. So yeah, with this one, um, I utilize some of the time imagery, you know, and I feel like when you first see the painting, it's, you know, maybe it's just, it's abstract, it's figurative, your eyes moving, you don't know what it means. Um, but then the more you look, you can start playing the game, you know, of what is this? 
Uh, so in the central area, it's actually um, a place in Wyoming that I went to. And if you look carefully, there's a braided loop and it's the same scene, but I painted it three different times, three different angles. So it's just that idea of now, like I'm really interested in trying to say now, like now, now, you know. So even in the sky, there's stripes of blue and they're different because it's that idea of like now and now and now, you know, there's no now, but it's just kind of playing with that idea of temporality and reality. So that's one example in uh, this painting. Okay, and then um, thank you. And then, what about in your uh, the hotel in Seabird Resort? Do you have any any icon or images in, within that work that that you could point to? Yeah. So if you show, let's see, maybe a detail shot. Um, yeah. So this one's it's more subtle, and and what I'm trying to do is talk about that experience of you know when you go to a place, specifically like a nature place. Um, we walk into it, we usually take it all in, like the whole gestalt of the space, and then you kind of see into various layers. So um, I'm really playing around a lot with scale. Uh, in the bottom left image, the top kind of whitish round shape is a datura, which is, um, it grows all over around here. It's actually a hallucinogenic flower. And then beneath it is a boulder with a little snail crawling around it um, in the sand at the beach. And then to either side are raptors. And then the little fuzzy images are fennel, wild fennel. So it's like playing with that scale and attention from micro to macro. And it works almost like how memory works, where it doesn't make sense, you know, and, and certain things are large and small. And it's not actually how it was at all, but that's kind of how you do it an event or a time or a space. Thank you. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, but it's something, you know, it, it'll give us more, you know, uh, some tools to look at your work when when um, visitors come in, uh, when guests come in and come to the spa and they can see your work. Uh, Margaret, let's talk a little bit about your work for the hotel, for uh, for Seabird Resort, um, the piece in the lobby, um, and all the pieces of this series. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, I want to hear a little bit more about the algorithm, um, and, you know, and the, and the, and, you know, it's like, it, just trying to articulate that. I'd love for you to really, to explore that a little bit more, and, you know, why you are working with these lines. I know you're working in time and memory as well, um, and in its in utilizing um, historic images. So if you could speak a little bit more about these. Well, sure. I mean, so my work is typically uh, not 2D unless I'm manipulating photos, but code provides this opportunity to write programs that generate you know, really interesting results, often randomly um, or strategically. And what I, I was attracted to is this idea that they were infinitely going. So you're seeing a still image because I captured a bit and overlaid it, but actually those are all versions of animations. And so to me, oh, okay. mm -hmm. aesthetically, it, it really fit on capturing this idea of experience over time. Um, but, but also that what you don't see is this process of a living kind of breathing media piece that got me to that result. Um, and so, and I just I love the perfection of symmetry and it just, especially with uh, the next one of uh, 12, I just really love that opportunity. So what that does is it's in the computer, it starts off as all straight lines across and then you're, I'm carving it with my mouse and it's slowly opening and warping. And I, it just, I mean, I hate to be so like simple, but it felt right. And <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> that's great. So I'm, uh, I was wondering though, you know, have you, I mean, do you bring in sound? Cause sound is, is, you know, such a huge part of your, you know, of, of your, you know, output. So does sound ever play come into the play here? Like in terms of, you know, that, 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 that the lines are based on sound um, or is it, more you know just uh, like a visual 
Well, tip. it's interesting you ask that. It's quite yeah. a serious question for me because I'm branded as sound artist. I got my MFA in sound arts. Everybody's like, where's the sound? Yeah. But, <laughs> and and it's, it's almost a prison, but it's also, you know, my body of research. And so, you know, I would argue that all art is sound art once you get talking about it, right? And all sound art is visual, is art, visual art once you start looking at it. And, and I'm trying to kind of figure out my relationship with sound and image right now. I'm actually really digging into that. But in this case, I would, I, I can't pretend that there's sound here, except what you hear in your mind when you look at it, which I do think is a form of sound. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So your thoughts are the sounds. <laughs> oh, that's, that's lovely. I, I like that. That's very nice. <laughs> So, and, and Einar, um, if you would like to speak a little bit to your work in the elevators in the sense that if we could maybe call up, yeah. Um, so if you could talk a little bit more about these and, and, and you know, I know that um, each elevator has a variation on this theme um, with lots of embellishments in each one. If you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the flow of the artwork from one to the next, if, there, if, you, if there's a narrative, um, and you know, and what icons, the iconography that you've incorporated in all of this, if you could speak to that a little bit, I think it would be interesting for the audience to hear. Yeah, so um, the, the, what you brought up in the beginning of this, uh, the group of questions is, uh, is the idea of hidden things. I think that we, we do love the idea of the Easter egg, as funny a term as that is um, in its own right, um, but the idea that there's something hidden. I think that um, anytime that you have um, that hidden information and sometimes in details, um, I keep thinking of fractals and the way that there is things inside of things that repeat themselves. Um, and I think that that's a big part of, of, of what we gravitate to is how, um, you know, you don't know. Um, I think, in fact, I think Annalisa talk, talked about that. Annalisa said something about how there's macro and micro and there's always this, you know, you know are, are you focusing on a tiny thing or, is it, or are you inside of it? You know, cellular structures as opposed to um, the macro and all of that. So for this project, we, uh, we did use the tower as a central, um, you know, we realized it's not a high tower, the hotel, but we, we were interested in, in uh, the cacophony of, of different people from all over the world traveling and tra what traveling means and how some people, for instance, get, um, um, since our first language was Spanish, how some people uh, get very irate if you speak a foreign language. And I've always, I've always loved it because I want to hear the, again, sound art again, coming back to that. I, I want to hear the, um, the way that the word flows, I'm really intrigued by how um, how we sound differently in different languages. You actually shift personalities a little bit when you speak a different language, and I and I think that that's one of the reasons we wanted to really go to Babel is is uh, the idea that there is um, you know all this uh, multiplicity of voices and sounds. Of course, we used images of the beach. That was kind of a no brainer going to a hotel that's basically staring right out there. Um, we have images from uh, historical stuff like that Ferris wheel on the left. The amphitheater that is on the bottom right is actually right in front of the hotel. And it's sort of this old, um, somewhat decrepit amphitheater that is still there and um, hopefully still being used. Uh, the Garibaldi has to do with uh, the, the, the that's the fish for California. I remember we uh, one of the first times we were at the Mercado Negro in Ensenada, we bought a Garibaldi and didn't realize that it wasn't a very tasty fish. And when we <laughs> fried it, uh, the oil turned bright orange. It was really quite beautiful. Again, I don't recommend it. It's kind of more of a looking fish than a eating fish. Uh, but a lot of symbolism in terms, of, I mean, we, we like to weave things and, and this image would shift into another as you move left and right with it. So even this image shifts to another image. Uh, we can see the other one if you want really quickly. Um, yeah, you can see great. there's a lot more content here. The beach on the right side is actually more condominiums down the street from the hotel. Um, again, but some of the things stayed like the, the tuna floating by in and out of barracudas are coming out of the tower and uh, up above is there's a, sort of a flower bomb spewing uh, another flower which we were asked if that was COVID um, which it wasn't interesting <laughs> we were being referential yeah. to COVID so um, a ton of stuff uh, we, you know we always think that um, 
that um, it's it's you know we un understand the need for artists um, that, that that the viewer has for the artist to help talk about their work, but we really prefer to hear them talk about it. The need's still there, and we don't mind addressing and talking a little bit. But um, you know, it's a, a meanings. That, there's a lot of meanings. There's a lot of avenues, and I think good artwork offers avenues of consideration. And you may travel down this path, or you may travel down that path. And that, that's how we like to, uh, to see these things. There is no wrong answer, including not liking it. It's okay if you don't like it. Now we are completely okay with that, <laughs> with that answer as well. <laughs> and and, to, and they're also just to mention that there are three by five feet, um, roughly those dimensions. And so they are powerful. They have a powerful presence. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, there, there is so much to look at um, and, and you know, navigate through, and it, it does require, a, you know, attention and curiosity. Um, and, you know, I love the titles. I, I wanted to get into that. We, we only have a few more minutes. I mean, there's so many questions. Um, so this is really just scratching the surface. Um, but, uh, but I do want to talk about titles. I'm, I'm a big fan of titles because I think that the artist has the opportunity to uh, you know, be playful, or you know, or you guide the audience in a particular way to think about the work. I mean, a, a title can have a, a very specific meaning. Um, there are artists who, uh, un who call their work untitled because they really don't want the title to guide um, the viewer to what to think about the work. So I want to. I, I know you just spoke on her, but I just saw your titles on your um, piece, um, the Babalicious, Babel Gunoush, and I forgot the third one is what was the third one um <laughs> I, for us i mean as, as when we started uh, making artwork um we were like the typical angry young man in in school and thought like screw it it's art it's about it's visual art you should get it visually and then as we you know hopefully matured a little bit we realized how important they are they're a way to i think draw in they're a way to um to give some clues maybe and but not too much so it's a it's like you don't want to spell it out because that's also not a very fun title um i think from my mother we uh, we we inherited a you know a love of puns and wordplay and uh, and we use that sometimes um uh, bilingually or whether it's english or spanish or or spanglish um which of course you're always wondering who is not going to get it and all of that um and also we love humor because i think humor is um, like um, I believe Annalisa talked about earlier, how you need a hook to bring people in. We only have a moment. So when you have a little, whether, whether it's a title that's humorous or your work, it's a little way to like make them stop for a minute and maybe not look at their phone. You've already won. Because if they actually thought about your work, what else? That's it. You, you that's, won. You won this thing. That's a win. It's almost Dadaist, right? Like the babble. <laughs> The babble, well, right? Like the good, like the language, the way it, it just, it's funny. It's like it very, uh, you know, it's humorous and, but it, and it, but it does lead you. It's the Tower of Babel, right? And it's, it's, so it does like weave back and forth. So I think that your, t the titles are clever. And we like to have fun with it. I think, with, I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with, with things being fun. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and Margaret, let's talk about your, like, there's, so you, your work. Uh, you know, there's uh, four pieces and you um, you have a, a, a title for the whole body of work and then each piece is, is titled. So can you speak a little bit to why you chose those titles? I mean, I, I don't think it's all that different from the way Einar described um, their title conventions, except you're more playful and fun. Um, I just, I do think that the title, I, I can never be arbitrary about it. I, I, right. I doubt... Any, but I think asking someone to read your artist statement is a pretty big ask and no one does that. So you have like one sentence. So how do I get you there um, somewhere? And, and that, you know, that was the intention with every title, but riffing off maybe the particular image. Wonderful, um, thank you. And then Annalise, what about you? Are your presence of mind? What is your uh, what is your um, the impetus behind me um, you know entitling that whole all those panels that one title? Yes, so all of the imagery in the Seabird project is in Oceanside. Everything, all the photographs and the nature tokens were, were collected and made for that piece for that space. 
Um, so it's connected to that idea that I was talking about earlier with regard to attention um, and consciousness. And I think, you know, perception and presence are all connected to that too. So, you know, I, it's almost as though our brains don't acknowledge something, you know, until we have noticed it, it doesn't exist. So you have to pay attention to the thing and then it becomes a thing, you know, that's kind of how our brains are wired. So, you know, and the same thing goes for all of our natural wilderness space. You know, if we don't pay attention to it, it doesn't exist. So that's definitely an undercurrent to my piece of the seabird is honoring um, just the majesty of our region. It's absolutely gorgeous. Nobody needs to be told that. But, you know, it's just, again, another reminder of how lucky we are to experience this. And, you know, that's one of the things I think that as artists that we have Kind of built in is the ability to notice little teeny details that some people can pass by. So, you know, I might totally key into the ripples of a shell or how a hand looks when somebody's twirling or, you know, something like that. So, so I included so many little details um, that maybe somebody would miss otherwise. So it's it's all to do with that idea of being very present in your mind in that space, you know, with the end goal of being like honoring the wilderness. Yeah, and that speaks to your, the, how you were speaking about one of your paintings um, a little while ago about the now, right? So it's very interesting. So it looks like it's time now to open up questions to the audience. Um, I'd like to, you know, thank you all very much for your, your insights. Um, and let's see if we have any questions. So let me uh, open it up over here. Q&A, let's see. Okay, we've got a question. Um, has, uh, 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 has Annalise seen Lynch's 1984 film, Dune? Oh, that's so funny. I was just talking about this with my brother who's gonna get a kick out of it. I saw it, but it was too long ago. So I will watch it again and I'm really excited. So I didn't know David Lynch did a film, Dune. I thought it was by a different director. Oh, okay, all right. Um, let's see another one for Annalise. Uh, she speaks to the blue in her paintings as presence in time and now, now, now. I understand that cyanotypes tend to be blue, but I wonder if that could also speak to the idea of now, now, now as the process of creating in the sun is never actually truly now. And in being the entry into this, and it being in the entry into the spot, does the piece as a whole convey the idea of presence of, and mindfulness and the idea of to be? Yeah, so the, um, the painting that I showed has the blue, and then the cyanotypes, of course, are totally blue. Um, that's default, you know, that's just the chemistry of the, the emulsion that turns blue. Um, so, you know, there's only so much I can control about that. So I don't know that it has the same, in other words, I'm not electing the blue, the blue is there. Um, on some of my work, I do manipulate the color a little bit. So you can bleach it using soda ash, and then sometimes I'll stain it with wine tannins or avocado um, liquid, or, you know, so I can push and pull the color a little bit. Um, but yeah, I don't know that it's the blue for the cyanotypes is as much of a conceptual. Okay, thank you. It looks like we just have the two questions. So I will ask another question that I had on my list. Um, what do you think about it? I'm curious about your thoughts on the, um, that shift to hotel as, the, as a museum, so as a gallery or museum space, as opposed to what you're normally or usually, you know, presenting your work in, in the different forums. Who would, who would like to take that one? I can jump in. Um, I actually have a, my mom's a landscape painter and she has been for 50 That's years. Right. And I have her paintings in my house and I have a memory of a friend going, why do you have all this hotel art in your house? And I was quite offended by it. One, you know, well, what does this mean? What is this hotel art stigma? And then two, that's my mom's paintings you're talking about. But the point is I've never forgotten that. And, and, and so what's the implication there that if you go to a hotel, there's like this rushed matching of art or, and I just, so, so this is a new opportunity for me with the seabird. And what I feel like was so like lovely about it is it feels very thoughtful, obviously, right? And there's multiple artists and anybody can see the work anytime. And so it really flipped from whatever 
old idea about hotel art or medical building art, it really became this lovely experience because of the, the curatorial practice of the hotel. Very well said, I like that very much. Um, it looks like we have another question here uh, because I don't wanna hog up all the time. Uh, have the artists found that being in the hotel has exposed them to a larger clientele? Or even as an artist hoping to make a living from creative passions, do you feel that living in the your artwork, living in the hotel, gives you opportunities for more storytelling and more money making? <laughs> who would like to? Who would be? Since we just heard from the lovely market, who would, who else would like to take this? I can talk about it. I um, I've never made work for this big of a space, so I found it totally, I don't know, thrilling to think of this many eyeballs and traffic coming through and engaging with the space. And I feel like it's actually really shifted how I'm thinking, um, certainly about moving forward with projects. I'm definitely pursuing, you know, hospitals or science institutions or libraries or something. I, I'm really keen to keep pushing into that um, larger civic space. It's just, I mean, I, of course, I love the idea of a work going into an individual home. It's very intimate, but um, I love the public conversational aspect that, that this you know, space you know, lends itself to. Yeah, you know, there, there are rotating spaces in the hotel area. For instance, Seabird has a gallery space, the uh, Oma West gallery space, and art will, artwork will be rotating through that. But for the most part, the art will be remaining and so that is a nice idea though that you can you can go back and visit the artwork um you know just often if you know and, and get and learn new things about the artwork um as well uh, einar do you have any thoughts on that yeah i do um i think that um we've me and my brother have done a bit of public art and i yeah. think when we got into public art we uh, we of course started from the that same angry young man voice that said, why is so much public art bad? Then, then, you're, then make some good stuff, right? So I think that you have the onus to do so. Another angle too is that when you do public art, you have um, the clients of whatever that space is. And I think that uh, I, we all know that um, art openings have you know, our friends. <laughs> it's a relatively small gene pool and they're like-minded people and they're wonderful and I love them. And uh, uh, even our collectors are within that realm and, and, and curators. So it's nice to have something in front of people who don't um, normally go to art galleries or museums. And I think that that's a wonderful opportunity always. It is, um, it is a crowd that, uh, that sometimes would not vote for art, you know, and, and if they had the choice. And that's also a great thing to sort of open their mind and say, well, you know, because you can't put things out to vote. You can't tell, the, you know, Joe six, six Pack, would you vote for art? They'll say no, of course they will. They not, they're, they're not, you know, that's not their realm. But it's good to see people who wouldn't have it in front of them actually start to let it seep in and say, hey, this is accessible. I can get into this stuff. And maybe they'll go to a museum or some other wonderful space. And uh, so that's how we get converts. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. and the thing is that, um, that uh, you know, the audiences will be, or well, viewers, I should say guests who come in. I mean, you know, it's, you will have lots and lots of eyes and it's they just, the hotels just opened and they're probably are very, you know, it's very likely that they'll be, potential commissions or, you know, interested patrons. Um, and as I said, they just opened. So, I mean, it's, you know, you'll have eyeballs all the way, you know, for as long as they're in existence. So it's really great, you know, because I had, um, uh, Adam had mentioned I'd work at the San Diego airport and that generated so much interest. Um, it was wonderful. So you are all in prominent positions and I can't imagine that it wouldn't generate, um, you know, more work or purchases or what have you. So um, it looks like, let's see. Oh, we do have another question here. Um, Einar from, from someone named Claudia. I loved your work, but trying to look at it closely and going up and down in an elevator is quite a ride. <laughs> also in a very small space makes your work even bigger. Hard to see all the small insertions that I was sure were there and bring the elevator and, and and being in the elevator reached its, uh, something about being having reached its destination. Uh, it's more of a comment, it seems, but um, how would you like to address that? I mean, I'm, you know, you probably could address 
the idea of the space and how you interact with yeah, that. Yeah, I think the discovery, we, we do like the fact that Lenticular has discovery. I like discovery and work in general, but um, it is, uh, I guess we're not minimalists, uh, maybe maximalists. And so there's a lot of stuff, there's layers and there's stuff to look at. And I think that, um, yeah, we, we, we like the idea that even somebody who rides that every day might actually notice something they hadn't seen before. Uh, we have work in hospitals, like you said before, how they have that, that in common. And uh, we've had clients that are every day in the hospital tell us how they find things and or they see different angle, how the light changes. So all of that is just great to hear. Wonderful. Uh, so it looks like that's it for our questions and we're just about finished now. So I'd really like to say thank you so much to all of you. I really enjoy the conversation and I'm very proud of your work in the hotels. I really am. And I'd um, like to thank our audience members for listening in.